going to do a little Tales from the Couch. I'm not going to get to a million games here. I want to get to what I thought was important from last night. And the most important thing, and yes, teams are missing players, uh, but the most important thing was Jalen Green with the Houston Rockets last night. He was incredible. We're going to spend some time on it. So no SGA for the Thunder. Chet Holmgren, bad game for him. Oddly enough, fouls out with 8.48 to go in the fourth quarter. So Houston, who's been on kind of this small thing with Jabari at the five or Jacques Landell, who Jock, I've just liked. You know, I know what he is. I know what he isn't. But what he is is what I like. And I, I think there's times in the past where I've seen him get limited minutes. And I'm like, man, that guy probably could play some more as a rotational big. I don't expect that anybody would think they were going to have him be their starting center. So looking at how this is playing out here with Shingun being hurt, and even with Chet healthy, you're like, okay, Oklahoma City's a little small, but they've got the other Jalen Williams to play, and then Kenrich Williams who's playing basically some five for them when Chet's gone for almost the entire fourth quarter. So that means a couple different things. On the offensive side with no SGA, it means that Jalen Williams, the one that scores, uh, season high, 23 field goal attempts last night. He's flirting with a 50, 40, and 90 shooting split month. When he gets an undersized body, like as good as Amen is on defense and his instincts and his athleticism, obviously he's a better defender already than Jalen Green, but like even if there are these lanky athletic dudes that he either has as the primary defender or gets into a switch, Jalen Williams has got a little bit of this Kawhi thing in him where he's so stout and he's also a sick athlete, kind of like how Kawhi you, you can sometimes forget how explosive and dynamic he is athletically because he just plays with so much pace. But Jalen Williams will get that shoulder into you and he'll either work you to the rim or he'll take that step back. And it's just nasty. Like there's just not a lot you can do with that. You almost need somebody who's more stout to hang with him uh, than, than just all that length because the length is great in the contest. The length is great on some of the, the passing lanes and, you know, trying to defend that way. Like I was watching Utah the other night against Luca, and I was like, what are they going to do? And they put Hendricks and Lar- uh, Lowry on Luca because it was like, well, maybe we'll just try to, to go with size because when you think of the way the roster is for the Jazz, you're like, well, George and Sexton and Clarkson, like you can't put them on Luca. And look, none of it works against Luca anyway. So it's, it's just something you'll notice where you go, Hey, this guy's like six seven, six eight. He's got this massive wingspan. He can jump out of the gym. He can do all these different things. And there was somebody like Jane Williams who's just so smart, played longer in college. He is somebody that can just get into you physically and move you off of his spot and find a way. And in a very short amount of time, this guy's figuring out like real veteran type stuff um, in comparison to some of these younger, younger dudes. So the other part of this offense without SGA last night, and this has gone on now for three straight games is Josh Giddy's offense. Season high 31 for him. Last three games, 19 points, 25 points, 31 points. He's 40% from three in March. I've seen in different matchups this season against the Thunder, when you're looking at whether it's SGA Williams, Giddy, Chet, you know, maybe it's Wallace, depending on the night. I think Oklahoma City's a little bit more willing to experiment with who they want that fifth guy to be. But you'll look at them and go, okay, well, what is the defense going to give up to try to stop SGA in these drives or at least impede them or just get him to pull up instead of getting the rim over and over and over again? I've seen certain teams, it's not like I'm watching every single Thunder game and focusing only on this, but I've seen teams be like, all right, Giddy's the thing that will give up because the shooting numbers haven't been good enough considering Giddy's 31% from three. So it feels like in their game prep, it's like, okay, if that's the closing five and Giddy's out there, we're going to sag off of Giddy to give help to SGA or Jalen Williams. Well, the other thing with Giddy is he's down to 25 minutes a game in his third season after 31 a game in his first two. But Giddy got back to being the guy without SGA of initiating all of this offense. And depending on how the substitution patterns worked out, uh, he'd be running everything because Jalen Williams would be on the bench for certain times. And granted, they end up closing together, but you see the point. It's like Giddy on the ball is still the best version of him because of his driving and because of his passing, and it's not necessarily a shooting. So sometimes he's almost miscast with this group having to sit around and watch, and that's why he's played less minutes. But I thought last night he had a baseline floater where you're like, yeah, this is kind of a reminder of like what the peak version of him is, even if he's playing less minutes in his third year, which is not good for him. 
Well, let's talk Jalen Green because that's really what this is all about. So Jalen last night, 37, 10, and 7, 14 to 24 from the floor. His March numbers are 29, just under 29 points a game, six boards, four assists. His shooting splits for the month are 50 from the floor, 43 from three, 80 plus percent from the free throw line. But we want to talk possessions. That's why you come to Tales from the Couch. Possessions. Let's talk about the brilliance of Jalen Green last night and this light going off with him. Uh, and I thought last night was like one of the best examples. I know he's been lighting it up all month, but I really, really was locked in on it. So we're just going to run through a bunch of things that I love from him. Um, Oklahoma City wanted to try to double him a lot when he was initiating the offense. He split the double it, towards a couple minutes into the fourth quarter, as well as you're going to see anybody split a double team. Like Kobe was the best I think I've ever seen at it. Dwayne Wade rejected the screen a lot. So, you know, if I'm thinking back, like surely Dwayne Wade is his split screens. But I think Kobe's probably the best I've ever seen do it. Jalen Green, he, and the best part was he wasn't just trying to do it all the time, which I think has always been my frustration with him as a player, which we'll get to here when he was a bit younger. But he splits it with a plan. And then once he's through, it's like Usain Bolt. He's passed everybody. And then it's him going at the rim. And now Chet isn't out of there. So there's zero fear whatsoever. And he takes off from like a step into the lane. Boom, he's at the rim. And one. It's awesome. All right. Next possession. He's got single coverage with Dort on him. Blows right past him. And there's just a bunch of undersized guys flailing at the rim. But it's not like we haven't seen Jalen Green, uh, Green finish against other big players. So we can't just make this out to be like, oh, Chet fouled out. Yes, it was easier without Chet. But it's not like he doesn't do this against other teams that have all of their guys. So right past everybody layup. Got past Dort. Then there's a three on two after a, uh, it might have been a miss, whatever, from Oklahoma City. Van Vliet's got it. Middle of the court, Jalen Green's on his right, Jabari Smith's on his left. Van Vliet throws it ahead to Green, where Green, for, for the first couple years, I don't think he makes the pass that he made last night. He's right side. He could have just kept dribbling, maybe get the free throws, maybe he finishes in some spectacular way. Instead, he switches, he goes right back to Jabari. So it's Van Vliet, right side Green, Green looks at Jabari in the left side, throws it across the paint. Jabari catches. He gets fouled as he goes up for the layup. That was my favorite play from Jalen Green last night. It wasn't the best one, but I thought it was the smartest one. Or the one that showed, it probably wasn't even the smartest one now that I think about it because I've got a bunch written down here. It was the one that showed me that he was like, now, like, I'm, I'm going to, I'm just, I have more awareness. I just don't think he makes that pass two years ago. And maybe there's a clip of him actually doing it at one point, but I think you get the point because it kept going on. Um, it's 102-101 Houston. Jalen's got Kenrich against him, goes right past him. He gets to the rim. All the help comes up to Jalen Green. Amen Thompson's in the dunker spot. He just drops it right off to him. Thompson did miss the layup. He gets double later. He doesn't force it. He brings it back out. He resets. Then he drives hard to his left where he's got door with him, but he finds a way to throw this bounce pass to Thompson diagonally across the paint, left to right. Thompson makes the layup. Um, the only play that was like, ah, it was a little tough. Dort locked him up pretty good. You're not going to beat Dort every single time going at him off the dribble. Jalen got stuck. It was a little late. Missed a really tough jumper. But the point is of that one is that was from this fourth quarter through overtime last night. That was like the only one you're like, ah, that might have been a questionable decision, but you're going to have a few of those when you have the ball as much as he does. Like everybody has some of these possessions. The problem is I think that used to be half of his possessions for me. 20 seconds left. Um, Oklahoma City misses. That was that weird Kenrich Williams deep shot that was just a tough look for them. Green goes super fast off the miss, but drives with purpose. But he's driving here fast, not because he's a young unbelievable athlete who's out of control he's driving because he's like i don't want them to get set i don't want to get their matchups ready and he brings it deep in the paint everything collapses then he kicks it out to the left corner for jabari smith to hit a three um Jalen williams hit a three to tie it back up we went in overtime i'll run through a couple of these green gets double teamed brings the defenders all the way to him to the sideline the right brings them away from the 
from the rest of the play, swings it quickly to Dylan Brooks, who then hit his second three of the overtime. It's not just making shots. It's not just hitting threes now at this absurd level, which is the part of him where we've talked about him in March where you're like, okay, but is he really going to be that kind of shooter all of a sudden now? I mean, maybe, but it's, it's kind of an outlier month. The difference is, is that there's just so many good plays in here for somebody. It seems like now he completely understands like, hey, when I have the ball, there's a lot of stuff that I can do, but it doesn't mean I have to do those things all the time because when I look at his physical gifts and you thinking like, all right, I can get by like almost every defender in the league. You know, maybe somebody will get me, they'll close me off, they'll guess right, right, right. But if you think of the guys with the ball in their hands, like how long is the list of players like ball in his hands? Like, I think that guy has the best chance of getting past defenders. Jalen Green's pretty high in that. And he was pretty high in it prior to this month where he's exploded. Just wasn't necessarily like consistent enough. And I know Shingu not being around maybe opens up some more of this stuff. The offense is going to look different without somebody who's going to initiate a lot of this offense, which is a good problem to have. We'll worry about that later. Right? I'm not going to worry about it right now. The fact that he is now understanding there's a difference between, okay, well, cool, you can beat every guy off the dribble if you want to, but then what? The, the growth as a player, because I'm sure coaches would tell players like this, yeah, it's great you can beat everyone, but what you need to be doing is realizing the benefits of beating the perimeter defense and all the good things that can happen off of it. Some of them might be sick dunks. Some of them might be N1 layups. Maybe it's a floater here or there, but there's also a scrambling defense that's likely outnumbered now four against three, and your teammates are going to play that much better once you start continuing to think about them. From the point you split the double team and have the advantage, from the point where you beat your defender, or the time you're coming up in transition and you're just flying down the court, there's still going to be some really nice options and you have to keep thinking about those because there's so many young scorers. And I'm like, he doesn't even think about anything but the rim once the game or once the ball, like that position is in this mode. We're like, okay, this is just mine. And like, you guys could just watch. That's what I thought he was for a long time. And I think that's fair. But last night was incredible for him. Like, really, I just, I just thought high level stuff, man, understanding it and not making mistakes for a good chunk in a close game. 